Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Detroit Regional Chamber's fifth installment of Lessons in Leadership. I'm Tammy Karnreich. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for the Chamber. Lessons in Leadership is a virtual series that will offer emerging leaders from business, government, and civic organizations, the opportunity to hear from experienced leaders, exceptional leaders, and what they've learned along their leadership journey. Um, before I do introduce today's speaker, I do have to um, first remind you that if you would like to see any of the previous sessions of Letters Leaders and Letters, let, Lessons in leadership, sorry, there's a, sometimes that gets tough. Lessons in leadership, you can find it on the DetroitChamber.com um, and you'll find all the previous series. Um, but what I first wanna do, I wanna thank our sponsor. Bank of America has been just a tremendous supporter of the Lessons in Leadership programs, as well as other leadership programs that are sponsored by the Chamber. So let me first introduce to you Matt Elliott. Matt Elliott is the president of the Michigan Market for Bank of America, a member of the Chamber's board, um, just a tremendous leader himself. So Matt, thank you so much for your sponsorship. Uh, we look forward to your remarks. Thank you, Tammy. Thanks for having me. And also thank you for uh, hosting this series. And uh, good to be with you, everybody. Good morning. As Tammy mentioned, my name is Matt Elliott. I'm the president of Bank of America Detroit and Bank of America Michigan. And you know we're, we sponsored this series in, in, in partnership with the chamber because if the pandemic taught us nothing, it taught us that leadership really matters. And we thought it would be a, a great idea to, to bring forward and, and lift up some of the lessons that uh, the various leaders around the state had in various sectors of the economy. And I'm really pleased that today we're gonna to talk a lot about health uh, and health equity among other things. Um, because frankly, if, if, you don't, if you're not physically healthy, it's impossible to be, it's impossible to be economically healthy. Uh, it's, it's so much so from our point of view that when we announced our $1.5 billion commitment to economic mobility in communities of color, we included as one of our four pillars uh, health, uh, because we know that health equity is just as important as economic. And so we're really excited today to hear from Dr. Gregory, uh, and I'm always excited, Tammy, to be with the chamber and with this group here. So thank you very much again for uh, hosting the series, and we're thrilled to sponsor it. So back over to you. Thank you, Tammy. All right, thank you, Matt, to you and also your team. So now it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Um, the privilege of speaking with Dr. Audrey Gregory. She's the president and chief executive officer of the Detroit Medical Center. Detroit Medical Center, or many of us know as DMC, is the largest non-governmental employer in the city of Detroit. DMC is a part of Tenet, one of the largest healthcare system consortiums in the USA. Dr. Gregory was named CEO in January of 2020. She joined the Detroit Medical Center in October of 2019 as the president of Detroit Medical Center and CEO of DMC's Adult Central Campus. Dr. Gregory has been with Tenet for more than 15 years, serving in a variety of leadership positions well, and came to the DMC from Tenet Healthcare <clears throat> St. Francis Healthcare System in Memphis, where she served as the market CEO and CEO of St. Francis Hospital in Memphis. So Dr. Gregory, thank you so much for speaking with me, with our audience. Um, and representing the Detroit Regional Chamber, also as a member of our board, we look forward to your remarks. Good morning. Thank you, Tammy. Thank you for those kind words and for your introduction. As I was listening to the introduction, I was thinking, ooh, I'm aging. I've now been with Tenet for about 17 years, and I am okay if people comment about how radiant and young I look. I am okay with that. Um, so thank you for those kind words. And um, and listening to Matt earlier, he is absolutely correct. I think the one thing, um, or country, and I think nationally and also internationally, we have learned as a human race is that leadership really matters. And so this morning I will walk you through some of that. So I 
want to thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedules or schedules um, to just sit down and listen, because I think it's important for us to always have ourselves refilled. So thank you for that time. Um, as Tammy said, by way of background, the DMC, as it's a well-known, well-loved organization, um, is a nationally ranked academic medical center. And what is our mission at the DMC is truly to just provide excellent clinical care um, to people in Metro Detroit. And we specifically um, care for the underinsured, the underrepresented, represented and the underserved. So um, it's what's unique about us. And so as you can imagine, as we as a country are dealing with inequities um, and social determinants of health, this is the space in which the DMC sits. So as um, Tammy alluded to earlier, we are a subsidiary of Tenet Healthcare, um, which is a national, um, and I think in some aspects, international company. And the DMC specifically have been around for over 150 years. So we're tried and true in our commitment to the DMC. Um, so, so, so today in the short time I have with you, I will share with you just the challenges we face as a healthcare industry um, during the COVID um, pandemic. Um, I think I will also spend some time talking to you about what the leadership team faced and, and something that I would just coin as leadership lessons. And then we'll spend some time just talking about, I'll touch on um, equity in healthcare. Clearly, as you can imagine, that is an entire topic on its own. Um, and so I just wanted to make sure that I was doing due diligence to touching on that. So as we all remember, I think we're now in 2021. Right? Do I have my years correct? So we're now in 2021, and sometimes we forget the beginning. So um, I remember as an organization, we were just enjoying 2020. Um, the year had started out really well. Winter in Michigan was not scary. Um, I had adjusted to that. I had figured out how to drive without being white knuckle driving. Um, we were coming into the last month of the first quarter. Things were looking up. My child had settled in school. And then in no time at all, um, we were faced with about 30% of Michigan's coronavirus um, cases were within residents of Southeast Michigan. So here I was. And, and the thing without a pandemic, um, by in, in the spirit of transparency, you should know that I'm a nurse by background. I've been in healthcare my entire career. It is the industry I know well. And so I always thought to myself in the background as an ER and trauma nurse that there's not a lot of things that surprise me. I can generally roll with it. And then came the pandemic and there was nothing like it before, at least in my lifetime. And so this was interesting because as, as seasoned as we were as healthcare operators, um, this was new, it was strange. We couldn't decide what it is. It took some time for us to decipher. Looking back over a year and a half, clearly we are much more adept at treatment regimens. We have, a, we have a good cadence, we know what we're doing, as is evidenced by the lowering of cases, um, the increasing of vaccination. We're in a much better place today than we were in March 2020. So as I'm talking with you, I need you to not think about where we are today, but where we were in March of 2020. And so all the health systems across our country, particularly in, in Southeastern Detroit, uh, Michigan, was definitely trying to figure out who's on first and what are we doing. We were faced with enormous challenges. As you remember at that time, even the guidance from our regulatory agencies changed almost daily. Wear a mask, don't wear a mask. You know, there are just so many different contradicting facts that were coming at us. Um, there, were confu there was confusion among our employees. And most importantly, there was fear, right? Fear of the unknown. And generally as healthcare providers, kind of like first responders, we are the people who, when everyone is running away from the fire, we're running in. So employees are still coming to work and we're uncertain about what it is that we're facing because we've never seen anything like this before. On top of that, finding supplies, right, became challenging. And as, as time went on and we figured out that N95 masks were important, there was a shortage of that all over the world. And so how are we going to manage through all of this? Well, I'm not one of those people. I love to read a good mystery and I, I love espionage. You know, those are my kind of books to read. And I'm one of those people who I don't skip to the end of the book. Like I love the journey. 
And so now that I'm talking to you, you know, I'm already at the end of the book. We kind of know how this is going to end, but I want to just talk a little bit about the middle. Um, and so I want to talk, tell you about lessons learned. And this for me, I will tell you as a person of color and as a leader of the DMC, this was quite the moment for us. And so some of the lessons I learned, I will start out by saying is uh, as a leader, it's important for us to note that there is value in transparency and over communication. I think I was the healthcare leader who said to my team, I, my communications team, I think they worked so hard the first year and a half because I wanted to make sure that we were communicating and communicating consistently with our team members, even around the fact that, you know what, I am uncertain but I will get information for you. And so we were transparent with all our key stakeholders. We were constantly apprising, apprising employees and the public of data that was important, critical updates, um, information, and guidance that we knew regarding COVID. So I would say lesson number one would be the value of transparency and over-communication. And I don't even know that over-communication is a real word. What I will say is communicate frequently, often, and clearly. I would say lesson number two for us was use of community partners and recognizing that in a crisis, you cannot go it alone. Um, everyone now just goes for their COVID-19 testing. You want to test, you go to CVS, you go to Walgreens, you turn up at a hospital. That is not how it was in the beginning. In the beginning, there was not testing available. And so as an organization, recognizing who we served, and if everyone remembered at that time, as Detroit was inundated with new cases, this was all in communities of color. And I and I remember trying to disconnect and be this leader that is leading this organization, but I couldn't because as I walked through my ER, um, my patients are people who look like me and they were impacted by this disease. And so what we did that I thought was really innovative for us, we looked at our community partners and in our case, um, we have a great partnership with our academic partner, Wayne State University. And so we put our heads together. I mean, we have great scientists in that university, great providers and staff. And so we figured out together how to manage testing for a population. So that's second lesson learned. Third lesson learned, which I think was very important for us was acknowledging how our employees felt. Um, people were scared. Um, I remember residents saying to me, you know, Dr. Gregory, now that we've figured out what they were dealing with, I don't wanna go home to my family. I don't wanna be, how, where do I stay? How do I live? And so I think it's important as leaders that as you're managing through uncertainty, um, I think it's important as leadership that we wanna make sure that we are listening to employees and that we're acknowledging how employees feel. I, I learned as a mother that it's really very important not to say to our children, um, you know, you shouldn't worry about that or um, don't be sad or you shouldn't cry about that. I think it's important also as leaders that we follow that lesson in that we acknowledge how employees feel and help them with solutions towards that. So I think one of the innovative we, things we did as the DMC, we provided housing for our staff. Like for those who didn't wanna go home, here are the places that you can stay um, as we work through this pandemic. The next lesson I learned, and I think probably this should have been lesson number one, was leader visibility. I think leader, leader visibility is paramount um, during a crisis. And I think generally as a leader and not just visibility, but presence of mind and attention. Um, I think I will say during the pandemic, I decided as a leader that we were not gonna use the bully pulpit. We were gonna use the visibility and empathetic pulpit because that, that is what was needed. And I think now is a point for me to note that it is important as leaders that we have emotional intelligence. A good leader has the ability to understand and manage your own emotions, because trust me, I have a family that we were going through this. I had family members who were impacted by COVID, but also understanding the people, the feelings of people um, around you. I, I wanna stop here and, and plug my entire leadership team who I think just did an, an amazing job. And I think I can speak on behalf of just healthcare leaders in Southeast Michigan who I was on phone calls with and video conference 
conferencing call with just saying that, okay, we're here for you, we're, we will help you. And so our entire leadership team, I think, did a phenomenal job of being present, rounding on our staff and listening to their feedback. And it, at times acknowledging that we did not always have a solution. One of the things that I think it's important for leaders also is to make sure that we're not just spectators. I think very often as leaders, we seem to be spectators as opposed to participants. And I think as leaders, it's important for us to be solutions oriented. And then I will say another lesson learned of my lesson learned is to be authentic as a leader and not to panic. Um, and as I was preparing this together, the words I used was, Know that you can rely on your knowledge base and your outcomes. And I remember this week watching the track and fields Olympic um, trials. And I don't know if you've heard about Gabby Thomas. She is an Olympian. Um, she is a person of color, woman of color, graduated from Harvard University. Um, and I think she's getting her master's in epidemiology. Don't quote me on that. But I, but I admired what she said. You know, they were asking her about how she ran. Did you think you were almost going to take out Flo Joe's record? Uh, how fast were you running? And you seem to be slow at the end, at the beginning, but you picked up at the end. And I remember she said, and I think it's very vital for leaders to understand that, is to trust your training. Um, as a leader, you know what you know. And very often, while I have never experienced a pandemic, um, I knew as a leader that I, I was clear on what the outcomes were that I wanted. And so I trusted my training. And I think it's important as leaders that we trust our training. And then I would say it's important as a leader that there is some authenticity. Um, and so you have to be your real self. When you come to work, I think you need to sit into where you're comfortable. And as, if you're leading an organization, I think very often we try to be someone else um, and employees can figure out when we're not being genuine. So I think it's important that we sit into that space of authenticity. And I will wrap up by saying, um, as a healthcare organization and across the country, I think there's so much work we need to do still on healthcare, on healthcare equity. I listened to a keynote speaker last week at our MHA meeting. And one of the things he said that I thought was so profound was diversity without inclusion is simply decoration. And I think us in healthcare, we've always known that healthcare equities have existed. We also know that social determinants of health impact the healthcare of our, of our country. And so as a healthcare organization, there's so much we have to do. I am proud of the work that Michigan is doing, not only with the um, coronavirus task force that was formed by our governor and led by our lieutenant governor that has done just amazing work, enough to have gotten an award recently from Research America. But really as a state, the work that we're doing around equi equity, equity, and equitable care, ooh, that was really good, for moms and babies um, is really telling about where we sit as a state and what we believe is important to us. Um, and so I thank you so much for your time. I wanna make sure that I'm respectful of it. And I wanna ensure that I give you time to ask questions and for us to have this meaningful conversation today about leadership. Tammy, back to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Gregory. My goodness, I think you could lead a class on leadership or maybe even write a book. Such great words of wisdom and such great lessons to share. Um, I thank you for all of that. Um, I do have some starter questions that we can talk until maybe we see some questions in the chat room. <clears throat> but I wanna go back like you did and start around COVID-19. Um, I don't, I don't think you mentioned this and people might not have thought about it when I said you were made CEO, but you were made CEO of the DMC two months before the onset of COVID. So you're taking on a new role in a huge system and then all of a sudden this national pandemic hits. How did the crisis change your approach to leadership and implementation of your vision for the hospital system? Oh, that is, that is a, a great question. I, I chuckle now, Tammy, and I say to my, my leadership team in Tenet, I'm like, man, you guys left, left a lot of things out during the interview. Um, who walks into a pandemic the third month of their job? Um, but certainly, I, I will say that um, the, uh, I am one of those leaders, to be honest, who, who I am is who I am. I sit very comfortably in, in who I am as a person. 
But one of the things that I will say, um, our, our vision at the DMC has always been about serving the underserved. But one of the things that COVID-19 really, I would say, unmasked many things that in our country and in our society that has been covert. And I think one of the things that it has done, it has solidified, if not changed, it has solidified for the DMC who we represent and what we're about. I, I remember as we were going through the pandemic and I was, yeah, I will tell you, I'm so proud of this team because everybody turned up every day for work. And the biggest thing for me in answer to your question, Tommy, I was walking, Tammy, I was walking through the hallway one day and a surgeon walked up to me. This is one of our cardiac surgeons. He is a great open heart surgeon. And he said to me, Dr. Gregory, put me where you need me. He goes, I'm a doctor. I know for now, this seems like a medical respiratory thing, but I'm a doctor, put me where you need me. I remember tearing up and I said to him, okay, I'm trying not to be all, you know, <laughs> too empathetic and tearing up. But at that moment, I recognized that not only was I in an organization that understood the community we serve, but it solidified for the organization how we were going to go about serving our community. And I'm that we knew that we had the best scientists to help us to do it. So I would say more than how it changed, it solidified who we were. Makes sense. You know, you mentioned earlier about your background um, as a nurse. Um, how did your experience as a registered nurse and chief nursing officer um, help with your leadership throughout the pandemic? Oh, that, that is a great, that is, I love that question. And my, my physicians will say this to you all, all the time. It's, it's easy to talk to an administrator who, in their opinion, um, can just immediately not only empathize, but understand what it is that we're going about. So that's number one. I think secondarily for me, because I am a clinician working in a healthcare setting, um, my decisions are going to be always based on what's good for our patients. Um, and so as a nurse, it, it really helped during this pandemic to understand what it is that people at the bedside needed. Um, I understood what it was for nurses to be exhausted. I knew what it was for nurses to be looking around and thinking, oh my goodness, I need more staff. But being a nurse also gave me the ability to call my chief nursing officer friends in tenant all across the country. I called CEOs and CNOs and I said, listen, send me nurses, please. And, and every region in our system was kind enough to send nurses to Detroit. And so being a nurse helped not only with those relationships, but just really helped me to understand what the health system was going through. So just taking off on that comment and your comment earlier about <clears throat> the great work that was done across the state of Michigan, um, hospitals and public health institutions became the focal point, obviously, for our response to COVID-19. Um, what steps have you taken to work with leaders, not only across the city and the region, the state, but across the country? to navigate the crisis and improve outcomes for staff and patients. So we are very fortunate, Tammy. I, I will say um, healthcare does a lot of things well. Um, and one of the things we have done well as healthcare is uh, we have created spaces for healthcare leaders um, to not just be competitors, but to actually be, I would say, uh, co cooperate and competitors, right? So put that together. Um, the Michigan Hospital um, Association um, provides that, that, that venue for us along with the American um, Hospital Association. And so as an organization, we've really, been, we've really been fortunate to be able to put our heads together to drive outcomes for patients. And, and I will also give a plug here for regional chambers because though you're not a healthcare organization, I think, you know, even for me, uh, the chamber, the Detroit Regional Chamber has really done a good job of helping healthcare organizations to navigate the world of business and to make sure that we're driving outcomes for consumers. And in our case, consumers have to be our patients. Yeah, so I, I can speak to, you know, our chamber. And um, when I think about how we had to immediately pivot and just really focus completely on how do we help the business community navigate this? 
Um, it was a lot of work, but the business community really needed it and systems like yours stepped forward. So thank you for that. So I have a question that's come into the chat box. It's a little bit long, so um, bear with me here. First of all, great discussion. and Thank you for your time. Do you have an opinion on why COVID-19 had a disproportionate impact on communities of color? If so, what can we do in the healthcare community to make sure that that doesn't happen again? Mm. And this person would also want to know your thoughts on what the healthcare community can do to improve SDOH um, and so ideas in connecting, yeah, and connecting um, people to social resources. So you, you sort of have three there. Um, it, what can we do in the healthcare community to make sure it doesn't happen again, disproportionate? Um, what are your thoughts on the healthcare community can do to improve that is, and, and the ideas of connecting people to social resources? Wow, this is a whole, I could do a whole presentation on that. Um, lots of, I have lots of, lots of opinion on why COVID-19 had this disproportionate impact on communities of color. But I will say, I, I will go to the science instead and some of the research that has been done. So if you think about communities of color, what we found out and, you know, or, or Wayne State um, University professors and scientists have already published papers on this. So there are some things that we had um, or community or communities of color or communities that very often struggle with other comorbidities. So whether it's asthma, diabetes, obesity, um, hypertension, which having those comorbidities lined up patients for being significantly impacted by COVID, right? So how, how COVID um, ran through our communities, it was certainly impacted by those comorbidities. And if you think about communities of color, and we'll talk a little bit later about social determinants of health, those are disease processes, chronic disease processes that we struggle with as a community. So, so there was that impact. The other impact is how we lived, right? So we sometimes live in multi-generational um, facilities. As, as people of color. And, and, and those are the things that make us a great community, communities of color, mother and grandmother. So, but we live in, we live in multifamily situations. And so those are some things that also, that also made it easier for transmission to occur. And then just simply like those social determinants of health. So transportation, you know, communities of color, we're still taking public transportation. Communities of color struggle with clean water. So something as simple as hand washing and and, and those basic measures impacted communities of color. As I sat on the, um, the, the governor's task force, we had stakeholders from all over the states, including our Native American communities. And it was, it was interesting just to see those things that the rest of society considers basic, may not be so basic for communities of color. So those are just examples of why this thing ran rampant throughout our community. And then the other piece of it was simply the math, right? So Southeast D Detroit, we are a largely African-American community. And so the math just kind of lent itself to the community in which we live. Um, and so the second question is interesting is what can we do as a healthcare community to make sure this doesn't happen again? I would like to say just hope and pray, pray, but my team will tell you that I consistently tell them that hope is not a strategy. We're going to have to plan and plan like I would say um, intentional people around not just social determinants of health, but in managing disease processes. I think the other thing we have to do, and as I sit on a number of task force for MHA or, or the state, is making sure that as a country, we are prepared for the next pandemic. There will be another thing. I don't know that it will be COVID. I hope to God it's nothing like COVID, but there will be another thing. And so for communities of color, um, particularly, or, or any kind of sect of community, I think it's important that we trust the signs. Even now, as we have, as we have, um, 
now have a vaccine and we know about the safeness, safety and the efficacy of the vaccine, yet Wayne County, specifically Detroit, has some of the lowest vaccination rates in the state. So the answer to the second part of your question is the healthcare community. Um, we're going to have to find ways to help our communities of color to, to trust the signs. We've been hurt by the signs. Um, we've been experimented on. And so we have a, we have a healthy um, distrust. Um, but currently that distrust is working to our disadvantage. And so my thoughts on what the healthcare community can do to, to improve social determinants of health. There's so many, <laughs> there's so many answers I have to that question. But, but I think one of the questions I will lean into is recognizing the importance as healthcare systems that we don't have all the answers around resources. And I think it's gonna be important for us to not only partner with the business community, but partner with many social services that exist in our community. I think sometimes as hospital systems, we believe that we need to be the be all and the end all. I will tell you, I have met some amazing community partners and the community partners around social services is that they're in our communities, they live in our communities, they work in our communities, and they know what our community needs. So I think we need to have more formal partnership in the overall healthcare community, recognizing that the healthcare com community is not just hospitals. I know it was a long-winded answer, but like oh, great. my soul great. in the question. Well, as you answered that, we've had more questions come in. So um, let me get to the next one. So great info. Um, did your communications to the public about COVID impact your employees' perception of the organization? You know, that, that, is, that is a really good question. So I, I will be honest and say I, I as a leader, I kind of marched to, um, I marched to a different beat um, because my focus is always about the patients and the staff. So I will tell you that my team, we didn't spend a lot of time talking to the media. I mean, I, I, when that was necessary, we did that, but we spent a lot of time talking to our community. And so one of the things um, post COVID, actually during COVID, we spent some time having employee focus group, just talking through how they felt, um, you know, how we move forward. So I actually got an outside consultant to come in and spend some time with our community, with our, with our employee community. And I can say unequivocally that in answer to this question, um, employees' perception around their organization, around the organization change and change for the better. I mean, we were exhausted, but one of the things employees consistently, and I wasn't present for any of those meetings because I wanted the consultant to really get good feedback from our employees. And one of the things, the consistent themes that came out of this was employees were proud. Um, they felt pride in the organization. They felt pride in the teamwork. They felt proud of what the DMC represents, where we sit, and who we take care of. And so I would say lots of good perception. Now, I am a realist. I would never say to you that we're in utopia with our organization or with our employees. But in terms of how they felt that the message was managed. Employees will email me, they, there are ways to just email me directly. And they consistently say to me, and, and we send a newsletter out, we still send a newsletter out to employees. And we still do um, this format we have used and we have done hundreds of education session or education set, set, education set, set education sessions for hundreds of participants around COVID. Um, and so that is something our employees really, really feel good about. That's the problem with being live. Now, you know, I can't correct that. Back to you, Tommy, Tammy. Yeah. So this next question, I think you've touched on a little bit, but um, can you share examples of initiatives you are working on to support more healthcare equity? Oh, Lordy, don't. <laughs> So first of all, you know, so at the DMC, we're a big believer in access, right? So an access for care and access, you know, an access for care for those who are underserved and underrepresented. So everything about us is that. But, you know, we have done some intentional things um, across the organization. And, 
And, and I, I'm not alone in this. Certainly my other competitors are not here um, speaking on this forum, but I can speak to the fact with pride that across Michigan, um, the majority, if not all of our hospitals have, have signed the pledge for the work that we're going to do around healthcare and healthcare inequities. Um, the Michigan Healthcare Association, we all signed the pledge to address racism and racial inequities. And so there's work to do around that in fact, at this moment, there's actually a webinar actually happening right now that part of my team is attending about how we do that work. Um, the other thing that we do, um, you know, at, at the DMC, we're very intentional. So even how we handle um, our vendor relationships, we want to make sure that we are handling supply supplier diversity because clearly, again, right, we got to sure that diversity has inclusion, otherwise it's just decoration. And so we want to make sure that that is something that we do as an organization. And then, um, the biggest thing for me that I mentioned earlier, there's so many things we're doing around inequities, right? How we address patients, how we address their health care, right? So one of the things I think a year and a half ago, our governor said, and, and it was a challenge for all of us in our state, is if you're a person of color and you have a baby in our state, why should your chances be higher of death, right? So, so there's a lot of work that we do at the DMC around um, maternal mortality and morbidity and making sure that we're taking care of all moms, but particularly being intentional about outcomes for women of color. So those are just some, some examples. And, and then I will say, finally, one of the space we're sitting very well is to make sure that we're helping people get enrolled for coverage so that they can have access to healthcare. Um, so many barriers, right? Um, that exist in, in healthcare, just in terms of getting access and paying for that access. And so over the years, the DMC has made sure that we sit in that space of helping people to enroll so that when the time comes that they need to access care, that they can access that care. Back to Tammy. You know, as you were talking and, and talking about the underserved, you know, just to step back a bit, I don't know how many people really understand the role the DMC has played for years mm -hmm. in serving the underserved yes. um, and different from many hospital systems. Do you want to share that information? Oh, absolutely. Um, and, and, and we we do it with pride. You know, it's so funny. Every time I, I talk to a member of the medical staff, they're like, this is where we want to be. And so the DMC, you know, our, our population or predominant population are those who are mostly government payers or no payers at all. Um, and so, and that is the majority of our patient population. Clearly, we're open to all patients. Um, we have the expertise to take care of all patients, but the DMC mission is about serving the underserved. And so, you know, our philosophy at the DMC is um, we take all patients, even those with insurance. Um, but beyond that, I will say our commitment is ensuring that your health outcomes should be really good. There sh should be no difference in your outcomes because of your inability to pay, the color of your skin or your religion. And that is something we sit into. Children's Hospital of Michigan, as an example, um, I would say for children, we provide from soup to nuts, right? And that is a mission that or providers we sit into. And so, yes, that is, that is who we are. We're very different from other healthcare organizations across Michigan and all healthcare organizations serve a purpose. But our purpose is really about sitting into Southeast Michigan. Um, Sinai Grace is an example. That is the only facility in the geography that that facility um, serves. And so we wanna make sure that people understand that not only do we do good work, but we are committed to the healthcare outcomes. We've talked a, a lot about health equity and approaching COVID-19 and we're slowly getting to the end here. So I wanna just ask a little bit about you as a leader. Um, how do you hope to use your position in leadership to empower others? Oh. Wow. So, you know, I, <laughs> I, I, I will answer that question by telling you a story. So my children, all three are, they were very early readers. 
Um, and that is because I committed to the fact, I read somewhere that if your children can read, they can be successful. And so my, all three of my kids are five years apart, five years between first and second, five years between second and, and third. And so I was having this conversation with my, my 14 year old recently. And um, somehow we went back to Hooked and Phonics because that's the, the system I used for them. And back then it was the flashcards with cassettes. Do not judge me. And for some of you, you may have to look up what a cassette is. And so I'm having this discussion with my 14 year old about how proud I am of him. And I'm glad I taught him to read early. And he says, mom, you didn't teach me to read. I'm like, what do you mean I didn't teach you to read? He said, my older daughter, he said, Olivia and Jaden taught me to read, not you. And I'm like, no, I thought, he's like, no, Olivia sat with me and did um, Hooked and Pop Phonics. So that for me is my lesson in empowerment, right? So I, <laughs> I think it's important as a leader, um, if the system only works when I'm there, then we have a problem. And so part of my job is to make sure I am truly a believer in the fact that leadership begins at the bedside, right? So I like to remind my team that we're non-revenue generating departments, not taking care of patients. And so our job as leaders is to take care of the human beings that are taking care of the patient, which, which truly comes with empowerment. So if you think about it, um, if I pick a nurse or I pick a respiratory therapist, right? If a respiratory therapist needs my permission in order to get the right catheter that is needed to take care of patients, then patients are not gonna have great outcomes. So I think for me as a healthcare leader, and part of it is probably because I am a clinician, but I think leaders generally, regardless of industry, understand the importance of not only empowering workers, but empowering employees that are closest to the work, right? So it is why in some organizations, service recovery is done by the person at the desk, not to have to call the supervisor to call the supervisor. So I think as a healthcare leader, it's sure. important and a leader that we empower closest to where the work is being done. Okay, so my final question, um, who is the leader that has most inspired you along your leadership journey? Oh, wow, that, that's, oh goodness. I, I, I can point to a lot of people, but I will say um, that my parents, I would say my parents are, I would say my core. I'm, I'm, I've read every leadership book. My dissertation, all 400 pages of it, is about leadership. Um, and so I, I can, I can, I can quote um, leaders. But I think the pragmatic and realistic approach of of my parents are, I think, what grounds me and what leads and, and what teaches me how to lead. So my mom, you know, very resilient. Um, is very strong daughters and you know my sister and I she'll say okay you got to decrease on the strength because you know you're, you'll never stay you'll never get married so you gotta stop it um but I think the resilience um the honesty the work ethics I would say watching my parents um as immigrant parents um the work ethics that they have um and that I've seen you know I my team will tell you I'm probably the hardest working person they will see. I, I will be here with them. I will not be here while they, you know, if they're here, I'm here. Um, so I think I would say um, my parents are the people that I go to. And along the way, there have been great leaders within my own organization that I look at. Um, many CEOs ahead of me. Um, I could uh, quote Covey and other health uh, other leaders, but I would say my parents have had just the biggest impact because uh, they have touched me where it's important and that's in my core, in my, in my soul and making sure that I remain authentic. Um, and I remember that every time I go home to visit my parents and it's my siblings and it's like, we never grew up because my mom will say, okay, who's on the dishes? And that just really reminds you that a CEO of the DMC, go do the dishes. <laughs> I mean, I've asked a number of leaders that question in this series and so often it is family. It's a mother, a father, both. Um, and I think that's really special because I'm guessing, Dr. Gregory, that's what keeps you so grounded. Thank you. They, they keep me humble. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. Well, I want to thank you so much, Dr. Gregory, for sharing your story and your perspectives today, not only on leadership, but, you know, approaching a pandemic and working with other individuals within your organization. Um, it's really been such a pleasure 
um, to hear from you. And seriously, I think you could teach a class or write a book because you've got such great words of wisdom. I thank you. Oh, it would take patience to write a book. <laughs> Well, this is true. This is true. So speaking of books, it, we do share the same love of the same type of books. Are you a Patricia Cornwall follower? So I'm a, I'm a Robert Ludlam and Mario Puzo. <laughs> okay. All right. I'll check them out then. Okay. I just, I, I, I absolutely, some days I'll do a, a John Grisham, but um, yep. anything with, you know, somebody, thrillers, you know, somebody, I like Black Ops book though. Don't judge me. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, everyone. You have no been judging so here. Awesome. Thank you. And uh, also, I want to say thank you again to Bank of America for sponsoring today's event and the Lessons in Leadership series. At least I got that out the right way this time. Um, we will continue doing more programs like Lessons in Leadership in the coming months. Um, however, we're thrilled to host our first in person event in just a little bit more two weeks away. So the Detroit Policy Conference is taking place on July 13th and it is at the Aretha Franklin Amphitheater. We're very excited. You'll be able to participate in person live and be able to look at our beautiful Detroit Riverfront. Um, so I hope you'll be able to join us and hear from speakers like uh, Mayor Duggan, Lieutenant Governor Gilchrist, Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson and many, many more. So you can find that information also on our website to register for that. And uh, after all of that, I guess it's just the right time to say thank you. And I hope everyone has a wonderful day.